Hello, and welcome to the overview regarding the Fairfax County Public Schools Restraint and Seclusion Policy. Today's overview will include provisions for parent notifications, debrief conferences, and policy requirements. The purpose of this FCPS policy is to establish procedures regarding physical restraint and seclusion. In rare cases where there is an imminent risk of serious physical harm to self or others and to ensure the safety of all students and staff. FCPS will use positive behavior interventions and support strategies to reduce and prevent the need for the use of physical restraint and seclusion. Our FCPS policy, which was voted on and approved by our school board, either meets or exceeds the Virginia Department of Education's requirements for this policy. Let's take some time and go over key definitions. The first one, physical restraint. Physical restraint is defined as a personal restriction that immobilizes or reduces the ability of a student to move freely. Physical restraint does not include briefly holding a student to calm or comfort the student, holding a student's hand or arm to escort the student safely from one area to another. The use of incidental, minor, or reasonable physical contact or other actions designed to maintain order and control. Seclusion is the involuntary confinement of a student alone in a room from which the student is physically prevented from leaving, provided that no such room or space is locked. Seclusion does not represent timeout, in-school suspension, detention, student requested breaks in a different location in the room or in a separate room. It does not represent removal of a student for a short period of time from the room or a separate area of the room to provide the student with an opportunity to regain self-control so long as the student is in a setting from which the student is not physically prevented from leaving. Seclusion does not recommend a removal of a student for a disruptive behavior from a classroom by a teacher. And lastly, seclusion does not represent confinement of a student alone in a room or area from which a student is physically prevented from leaving during the investigation and questioning of the student by school personnel regarding the student's knowledge of or participation in events constituting a violation of the Code of Student Conduct, such as a physical altercation or an incident involving drugs or weapons. Serious physical harm means bodily injury that involves a substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain, protracted and obvious disfigurement, protracted loss or impairment of the function of a bodily member, organ, or mental faculty. For this policy, serious physical harm is synonymous to a serious bodily injury. Last on our key definitions is imminent risk. Imminent is threat exists when the person's situation appears to pose a clear and immediate threat of serious violence towards others that requires containment, and action to protect identified or identifiable targets. For this policy, imminent risk is synonymous to imminent threat. Fairfax County Public Schools prohibits the use of seclusion except at the Burke School, Key Center, and Kilmer Center. FCPS shall also have a division-wide prohibition of seclusion on or before the beginning of the 2022-23 school year. FCP prohibits the use of mechanical restraints. However, the term mechanical restraints does not include the devices implemented by trained school personnel or used by a student that have been prescribed by an appropriate medical or related service professional and are used with parent rental consent and for the specific approval purposes for which such devices were designed. FCPS prohibits the use of pharmacological restraints, aversive stimuli, use of a restraint or seclusion in any manner that restricts a student's breathing or harms the student. Prohibits the use of physical restraint as a form of punishment, discipline, retaliation, convenience, or to prevent property destruction. 
FCPS prohibits the use of corporal punishment, the use of seclusion rooms or free, freestanding units not meeting the standards, use of restraint when medically or psychologically contradicted as stated in a documentation provided to FCPS by the IEP or 504 team, school professionals, or by a licensed physician, psychologist, or other qualified health professional under the scope of the professional's authority. FCPS prohibits the use of prone and supine restraints. No prone restraint is completely prohibited in the state of Virginia, and supine is where FCPS exceeds in our policy by prohibiting supine restraint. The use of physical restraint or seclusion, again, seclusion is only permissible at Burke School, Key Center, and Kilmer Center. Physical restraint and seclusion is only permitted when other interventions are or would be in the reasonable judgment of the particular school personnel, ineffective, and only for the five reasons as outlined in accordance with the Virginia Department of Edu Education regulations. These five reasons include, number one, prevent a student from inflicting serious physical harm or injury to self or others. Two, quell a disturbance or remove a student from the scene of a disturbance in which such student's behavior or damage to property threatens serious physical harm or injury to persons. Unless a student's damage to property creates an imminent risk of serious physical harm or the injury to the student or others, the damage of property does not itself indicate an imminent risk of serious physical harm or injury and shall not be the justification for the restraint or seclusion of a student. Number three, defend self or others from serious physical harm or injury. Four, obtain possession of controlled substances or paraphernalia which are upon the person of the student or within the student's control. And number five, obtain possession of weapons or other dangerous objects that are upon the person of the student or within the student's control. The use of physical restraint and seclusion shall be discontinued as soon as the imminent risk of serious physical harm or injury to self or others presented by the emergency situation has dissipated. School personnel are not required to attempt to implement a least restrictive intervention prior to the use of physical restraint or seclusion when, in the reasonable judgment of the school personnel in an emergency situation, a less restrictive intervention would be ineffective. For example, if a student was running into a busy street. School resource officers shall not be involved in the physical restraint or seclusion of a student initiated by school staff unless there is an imminent danger of serious physical harm to self or others. Let's unpack the use of physical restraint by looking at three scenarios and determining if the behaviors listed meet one of the five reasons that justify the use of a physical restraint. For this activity, if you feel like you need more time, don't hesitate to pause the video before continuing further. Scenario number one, so take a moment and read it. And then we're going to talk if the scenario met one of the five reasons. When we first look into this scenario, it's our answer is going to be no. It does not meet one of the five reasons that justify the use of a physical restraint. However, do the behaviors listed need intervention from staff? Absolutely. Staff can safely remove the scissors and the chair using an object removal or peeling technique that they learned in either professional crisis management or MAT. Once the items are removed, the student would no longer be at that high risk of needing a physical restraint, so the staff can safely implement other de-escalation strategies to maintain safety for both the student, other students, and the staff. So based on that, we would not select one of these five reasons because we would not move forward with a physical restraint. Scenario number two, take a minute and read scenario number two.
Before we unpack this further, let's revisit our definitions. Remembering serious physical harm means bodily injury that involves substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain, and that imminent risk is a clear and immediate threat of serious violence. So as we look at the behaviors described in scenario two, we can see that we do not meet the definition of serious physical harm and imminent risk, so we would not move forward with a physical restraint. However, the staff would need, would need to intervene and implement, for example, some other strategies such as possibly a room clear, blocking and redirectly. We want to make sure that we're safely supporting the injured student and the teacher to help make sure we can de-escalate the situation and get the support that's needed. So we would not select one of these five reasons because it would not meet our criteria. Let's look at another one. Scenario three. Take a moment and read scenario number three. Does this scenario meet one of the five reasons that justify the use of physical restraint? Our answer is going to be yes. And this might look a little similar to scenario number one. The difference here is when the staff attempted the least restrictive intervention to remove the pencil sharpener, the student continuously began to punch the student who was bleeding. So then again, this would meet our criteria to implement that physical restraint. In scenario one, once we were able to remove the objects, the students kind of didn't escalate further the way they did in this situation. So this is why we would select yes. And for those five reasons, the first one would be we are preventing a student from inflicting serious physical harm or injury to self or others. And it also could be number three, where we're defending self or others from serious physical harm or injury. Now we're going to move into the notification and reporting of our new policy. As soon as practical, but no later than the day of incident, a staff member involved shall report the incident of physical restraint or seclusion and the use of any physical, um, I'm sorry, and the use of any related first aid to the school principal or designee. The school principal or designee or other school personnel shall contact the parent regarding the incident and any related first aid. Forms of contact include in-person or phone communication or communication that's been authorized by the parent, for example, text messages, leaving a voicemail, or sending an email. As soon as practical, but no later than the day of the incident, the employee involved in the incident or other school personnel, as may be designated by the principal, shall complete a written incident report. That form is in our electronic forms cabinet and it's labeled use of form, use of physical restraint or seclusion incident documentation. Then they're going to provide the principal or designee the written incident report and they're going to provide the parent with a copy of the incident report. On the incident report, these are the items that are included. The student's name, age, gender, grade, ethnicity, and special education status as applicable, the location of the incident, the date, time, and total duration of the incident, including documentation of the beginning and ending time of each application of physical restraint or seclusion, the date of the report, the name of the person completing the report, the school personnel involved in the incident, their roles in the use of physical restraint or seclusion, and their completion of the division's training program. Description of the incident, including the antecedent, resolution, and the process of return of the student to its educational setting if appropriate. A detailed description of the physical restraint or seclusion method used. The student's behavior that justified the use of physical restraint or seclusion. Description of prior events and circumstances prompting the student's behavior to the extent known, a least restrictive intervention is attempted prior to the use of the physical restraint or seclusion, and an explanation if no such intervention, interventions were employed. Whether the student has an IEP, a Section 504 plan, behavior intervention plan, or any other plan. If a student, staff member, or other individual sustained bodily injury, 
the date and time of the nurse or response personnel notification and the treatment administered, if any, date, time, and method of parental notification of the incident as required by this section, and the date, time, method of the staff debriefing. As soon as practical, but no later than two school days of the incident, the principal or designee will have a staff debrief with all involved to discuss whether the use of restraint or seclusion was implemented in compliance with the FCPS policy, how to prevent or reduce the future need of physical restraint or seclusion. When uh, our staff brief is, is, is happening, these are some components to consider. Discussing those circumstances, which are the antecedents leading up to the incident, the incident itself, discuss the least restrictive and most restrictive interventions used and were the most restrictive interventions needed. From the information gained, discuss the changes, if any, that should be uh, made and discuss if the team needs any additional support, such as consulting with your behavior intervention teachers, your ABA coach, your clinical staff, psychologists, et cetera. As soon as practical, but no later than two school days of the incident or upon the student's return to school, as appropriate, depending on the student's age and developmental level, the principal or designee shall review the incident with the student to discuss the details of the incident, an effort to assist the student and school personnel in identifying patterns of behavior, triggers or antecedents, alternative positive behaviors or coping skills that a student may utilize to prevent or reduce behaviors that may result in the application of a physical restraint or seclusion and impact of restraint or seclusion on the student to provide support and or identify the need for and facilitate the provision of additional social emotional supports, for example, such as meeting with your counselor, social worker, case manager, if applicable as appropriate. As soon as possible, but no later than the end of the following school day, dependent on access to the student. The student will conference with a trusted school personnel. The student should choose the trusted adult. However, if that is not possible due to age or developmental level, school staff may choose among team members and or consult with a parent or guardian regarding the most suitable staff person for conferencing. The staff who conferences with the student may consult with the clinical staff or support staff to explore further resources as needed. If the student declines to engage in this conference, the student's request will be honored. The student debriefing conference components of the student debrief to consider, again, are student's age and developmental level, when conferencing with that trusted school personnel, do we need to consult with the parent to identify trusted personnel? Think about the crisis cycle and where the student is and what supports might be needed each way, part of the, the cycle. Individualized for student, so thinking about what accommodations or modifications might be needed for this debrief. And additional resources to consider. Again, consulting with our applied behavior analysis, coach, behavior intervention services, or intervention and prevention teams. Also, we can help to develop and individualize the student debrief process if needed. Following an incident of restraint or seclusion, school staff will provide the student's parent or guardian with the resources and offer them an opportunity to participate in a follow-up conference. This will be coordinated through an administrator, teacher, counselor, counselor, or clinician and staff have support from the Employee Assistance Program, if needed. In the initial development and subsequent review in the, in the initial development and subsequent review and revision of the student's IEP or se Section 504 plan, the student's IEP or 504 team shall consider whether the student displays behaviors that are likely to result in the use of physical restraint or seclusion. If so, they should consider a functional behavior assessment, 
a new or revised behavior intervention plan, new or revised IEP goals, or an, and any additional evaluations or re-evaluations if needed. Within 10 school days following the first school day in a single school year in which an incident of physical restraint or a seclusion has occurred, the student's IEP or 504 team shall consider, among other things, the need for a functional behavior assessment, a new or revised behavior intervention plan, new or revised IEP goals, and any additional evaluations or re-evaluations. Now, if a student does not have an IEP or 504 plan, then the team might consider a referral to local screening for a gen gen general education student. Trainings for our policy. First one, de-escalation level one, which is understanding the regulations governing the use of restraint and seclusion. That is FCPS policy require that school personnel receive training on skills related to positive behavior support, conflict prevention, de-escalation and crisis response, including follow-up support and social emotional strategy support for students, staff and families. This training is located on my PDE in video modules and can be found either by typing in de-escalation level one or understanding the regulations governing the use of restraint and seclusion on my PDE. Second, we have de-escalation level two, our advanced training. In Fairfax County Public Schools, that would either be our MAN or professional crisis management training. That's for at least one administrator per school building and for school personnel assigned to work with any student whose IEP or section 5014 determines the student is likely to be physically restrained or secluded and receive this advanced training. MAN training is provided from the Behavior Intervention Services team and Professional Crisis Management is from the ABA coach team. Um, both of those teams should have contacted you about scheduling these trainings. This slide, we're gonna talk about caring culture. This is a good reminder that we wanna let all staff know that FCPS is committed to fostering a responsive, caring, and inclusive culture where all feel valued, supported, and hopeful. We want to make sure that we have a welcoming environment where all students feel respected and included at school and that all staff will, will view the student behavior through a culturally responsive lens. In addition to that, we also want to make sure that we are looking at it with a trauma-informed lens as well. Um, and by doing that, we're being proactive to help support the student um, and again in that caring culture. We also want to promote healthy life choices, which are those positive relationships with peers and adults. And that's why when we go through our PCM and MAN training, uh, the first thing that we do is always looking at how can we build healthy relationships as well as healthy social emotional skills. Now, we do know that there are going to be times when if a physical restraint had to occur or a seclusion, or maybe it was even just a challenge of behavior that did not result in a um, physical restraint or seclusion. But we wanted to make sure that we highlight that if a student, if in one of those scenarios, the student engages in property destruction, we cleaning up could possibly be looked at as punishment, which does not support a caring culture. So after a student engaged in some property destruction, it's not something we wanna make them have to clean up because that would not be FCPS's idea of a caring culture as well as if we think about if a student possibly might um, have an accident where it's bodily fluids, having a student clean up their own bodily fluids would also not be permitted in FCPS. This action, again, would not reflect our idea of a caring culture. Annual reporting and review. So the principal or designee shall, so this is when we are gonna submit a copy of the incident report, which is our use of physical restraint or seclusion incident documentation form that can be found. We're gonna go over that in a few minutes. Um, but what we're gonna do now is when this form is completed, you're going to email that to crisisprevention at fcps.edu. Emailing supersedes the form or process of how we used to pony it or uh, send it um, email it to the Director of Office of Special Education and Instruction. By you emailing to crisisprevention at fcps.edu, all of the stakeholders and central office will get access to that form as soon as possible. 
Lastly, you want to make sure that you are documenting each instance of physical restraint or seclusion in CIS. All right, now we're going to go move into our FCPS use of physical restraint or seclusion incident documentation. This form can be found in our electronic file cabinet, also can be linked from the due process and eligibility internet page. When you do open it, or if you type in this link that you can see directly here, make sure that you open it using Internet Explorer. If you open it in Google, you might actually get our old form and or you might get an error message saying that it's coming. So again, best bet is to open it um, in Internet Explorer and you'll have no problems. With the incident documentation, the like your first thing you're going to do is you're going to indicate was it a physical restraint or seclusion. Remember, seclusion is only permissible at Burke, Key, and Kilmer Center. You're going to put the student's name, date of birth, gender, grade, ethnicity, their ID number, what school. To indicate the status, was it a gen ed student, a student with an IEP, or a student with a 504 plan? If it is an IEP student, you're going to indicate the primary disability. You're going to have to indicate what did it, does the student currently have the behavior intervention plan? And then we're going to go into the um, date of the incident, which is going to have the begin time and the end time. And in this example, you'll see that the begin time was at 10 and the end time was at 1010. However, the total duration of, of the incident was only three minutes. Based on that, we're going to then go down to this box down here. And what you're going to see is that we're going to put that was a restraint or seclusion. The begin time was 10 o'clock end time was 1001, which was one minute and then 1003 to 1004, one minute, 1009 to 1010, one minute. So the total duration was three minutes, but this is going to help us break it down. So as a team in your building and from central office, we can look at this, seeing how long these um, behaviors occur and how long the physical restraint lasted. It's going to give us really good information. Also documenting who completed the form, your position, and the date you completed the form. Next, you're going to see um, you're going to have to fill out who is the person implementing the physical restraint or seclusion. So here we have two different examples because people who are able to implement a physical restraint or seclusion should have went through MAT or PCM, uh, Professional Crisis Management Training. So this first one, Jane Doe was a teacher. Yes, she was trained in MAT and she implemented a one person side body hug. As you can see, the implementing the one person side body hug that's language directly from man. And it's almost like a sentence starter, which this is going to help us later on in this form. Then here in the PCM example, Jane Doe was a teacher. Yes, they were trained. They implemented a two-person standing vertical immobilization. And John Doe was the IA who was also trained implementing a two-person standing vertical immobilization. Here we get to number one, we're going to identify the least restrictive interventions used prior to the use of physical restraint or seclusion. So if the student, you were doing reminders of a reward system, offering choices, using redirection, you would mark all of those. If the um, prior to the use of physical restraint, the least restrictive intervention is not listed as one of these options, you would check other and type out what that looked like. Or if there were no least restrictive interventions, you would check this box and describe why there was none um, previous interventions. Here is we're going to document the condition that triggered the use of physical restraint or seclusion as we kind of practice through our scenarios. So in our scenario three, we decided that we were preventing a student from inflicting serious physical harm or injury to self or others. And then we also selected defend self or others from serious physical harm or injury. So you again indicate one of those. Then here you would provide a detailed description of the student's behavior. So if the student engaged in aggression, what does that aggression look like? You would define it out as objectively as possible. If, if it was like you took a picture of that behavior, what did it look like? So aggression was with a closed fist the student engage and hit the, the staff member seven times in the right arm. So you're being really descriptive of what that behavior looked like. Here we're going to go um, provide a detailed description of the incident, including the antecedent, the resolution, and the process of return of the student to their educational setting. 
Let's take an example and look at one of those already done. So take a minute and read this, and don't forget if you need to pause the video, pause the video. So in this detailed description, we want to make sure that we have the antecedent. So in this example, we had the antecedent would be examples of transition to English, a demand was placed. What was the resolution? The resolution was the students start, began to sitting at the desk, low level demands, the escalation breathing techniques were used. And then what does this example have a process of return? And yes, we have it here talking about the student began to have 10 minutes of success. Other students returned to the class. So it's really important that we're capturing all this in here because, again, this is where we're going to be able to use this information to determine trends, look at the behavior, what happened right before, kind of that ABC antecedent behavior consequence. It's going to help us figure out what we can do to support the student moving forward. In box four, you're going to provide a detailed description of the physical restraint or seclusion method used. Um, and again, this is where we, in the beginning, we talked about, um, we had that PCM and MAN example. So in here, you would describe, for example, um, staff member working with the student implemented a single Sunday stroll followed by a one-arm wraparound procedure for 20 seconds. From the one-arm wraparound, when the student demonstrated three seconds of calm, staff baited out to a Sunday stroll followed by a wrist tricep, back and, back and independent walk procedure. All of that language, that's an example from professional crisis management of what that detailed description of the physical restraint look like. Box number five, you're going to indicate that anyone sustained bodily injury. If yes, you're going to mark yes, and you're going to list the date and time of the response personnel, the notification, and what treatment, if applicable, or you would mark no, if no, um, if no one sustained injury. Okay, getting into the ending of our form, <clears throat> you're going to see here we have six, seven, and eight are the staff debrief, the student debrief, and the student conference. The first thing you're going to see is when, um, so when, this, when did the staff brief occur? Remember in our timeline that the documentation, this needs to be sent home to the parent the day of. However, staff debrief, student debrief, and student conference, you have up to two days. So if in best case scenario, the behavior happened at nine o'clock in the morning, which implemented, um, which resulted in a physical restraint, you're gonna have that staff debrief. So it might be completed by the end of the day. However, say this happened at 4.30 as the student was transitioning onto the bus, you might have to indicate that this is in progress um, and then come back to the form, which we'll talk about in a second. You also want to make sure that you're doing the method of the debrief. So the method of the debrief could just be, it could be um, staff meeting. So you just describe, because this is how the VDOE policy um, indicates that we need to have the method. So again, most of the time, you're probably just going to type in this box, uh, team meeting, or possibly maybe you did it through Microsoft Teams, and you might just say um, virtual meeting. The important thing is that you're documenting the method. Same thing for the student debrief and student conference. You're going to mark completed or in progress. The method of how that conference or debrief occurred. Now note seven and eight, the student debrief and student conference might happen at the same time. It's really going to be dependent upon that student. Um, again, we want to individualize it for each student so that way that this process best meets them and gets them that conference and debrief that they need. Um, but with the student conference, the student does have the option to decline the conference, if, and if so, you would indicate it there. Now, say you filled out this form and sent it home the day off, but all of these were in progress. What you would need to then do is, once it's complete, you would send the form again with checking complete, the date that it was completed. Um, I would recommend sending it to the parents again so they can see that this occurred within the timelines, and then you're going to send it to the crisis prevention email for a second time as well. Uh, the notification of the incident, you're just going to mark when you notified your administrator in your building, um, indicating how the parent or guardian was notified. Was it a phone, text message, email, in person? There's an option here for other. So for example, if you called the parent and they did not answer and you left the message, 
that could possibly be your other box. Then the copy of the incident documentation. So when was it emailed to crisis prevention at fcps.edu? And then a copy of the incident documentation sent to the parents. All right, so now we're, as we're wrapping up, if you have any questions, I think from anything from this presentation, we at Central Office wanna make sure that you feel supported and that we're here to help. And again, a lot of these situations might have to be individualized based on the student. Here's some contact information for people who can support you. From ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is for where, who does the training for professional crisis management, your contact is Kelly Lobo. Behavior Intervention Services, which is also MANT, is Lori Creighton. Due Process and Eligibility is myself, Brad Bartasevich. And from Intervention and Prevention, we have Deb Deborah Scott um, and all the contact information there. Additionally, we have optional crisis prevention and um, policy office hours that are available on Mondays from three to four from this link, where you can also get this link from the Due Process and Eligibility internet page. Thank you so much and have a great year.